Ladies and gentlemen, the Speaker of the House from the great state of Louisiana, Mike Johnson, joins me now. Mr. Speaker, thank you so much for joining us. So much to get to, sir. Uh, you are the, the man in the hot seat, so to speak. So I went through a couple of things that were that Americans, I believe conservative Americans, are concerned about. The one thing that seems to be pressing right now is, is y y the border. The border, the border, the border. And I know you're very concerned about the border. But some people are now saying, including some people in your own caucus, are saying, we're concerned that the Ukraine funding may be standalone and not include the border. Take a look at uh, Congressman Tom Massey, who says it's East. I'm sorry, this isn't an April Fool's joke, but you, along with Schumer, are looking to put something through on Ukraine without addressing the border. Mr. Speaker, is that true? And tell us what your thoughts are on the border and Ukraine. No, it's not true. I haven't had any conversation with Chuck Schumer about this at all. Um, what Thomas should know is that we've been working uh, very methodically with our with our conference and all the House Republicans, remembering that we have a one vote margin. As you said, Eric, we got to build consensus on this, and we have said consistently from the very beginning. I mean, literally from the day that I got the gavel back in October, that our national security. Uh, this is a national security supplemental package. That's how the president presented it. Begins with our own border. It's the number one issue in America, morally, constitutionally, legally. We have to get the border secured. That's what House Republicans are committed to, and that's always been the top priority. So it's front of mind. It's front of the conversation. What we've been talking about with, with Ukraine and the, and the National Security Supplemental, which also includes Israel and the Indo-Pacific region, is, is um, some of the new concepts that you've been hearing about, the Repo Act, for example, with regard to lethal aid to Ukraine. If you could use the seized assets of Russian oligarchs to fund that, that's, that's a, a no-brainer. That's not taxpayer dollars to do that. Uh, we talked about the loan concept, President Trump has talked a lot about this in recent days, where if we're going to do foreign aid, we do it in, in terms of a loan instead of just a gift. Um, we, we're talking about additional sanctions on Russia and, and energy exports from the U.S., because that uh, takes the fuel out of Vladimir Putin's war machine. So there's a lot of things that are very conservative in our approach, and that's what we're talking about, and we're putting that package together, trying to figure out what the contours but, 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 sir, are. So will yeah. you, will, yeah, the perception is that Nothing should come in front. Of, no funding should come in front of the border funding. Will, is, is it feasible that this this other bill or bills that you're going to put forward uh, regarding foreign funding, foreign aid, will precede border funding? No. Look, we we passed HR two, our our comprehensive border uh, security measure. Yeah, but, that, uh, but sir, no, I don't mean to interrupt. Now, I don't mean to be rude or interrupt, but. It's, that's been on Chuck Schumer's desk for 350 days. That, that's not exactly. going away. My concern is that anything new going forward would be without the border. I think a lot of Americans would feel the same way. Final thought on that one before we move on. No, well, we're trying to keep that all together. And that's been the stipulation at the very beginning. We've been very consistent with the White House and everybody involved. The, the president has executive authority right now, Eric, as you know, to fix the border. And he refuses to use it. Why? Because they did this intentionally. And that's the reason we're impeaching Mayorkas and doing these other big things, because uh, the president refuses to use the, the authority that he has right now under statutory law. All right. The other topic of the day is last week, I believe, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, another member of your caucus, floated the idea of, you know, doing this whole dance with let's let's replace the speaker again. I'm not sure. Let's take a listen to, to her in her words. Do you really think that there's someone who can get 218 votes to become Speaker of the House? Uh, I certainly hope so. I mean, it was so hard to go the last time. It You're going to go through hard, the It was hard to go the last time. But look at where we are now. We ju the, they just passed a funding bill that doesn't secure our border. Is this the fight you want to have in an election year? Absolutely. It's the fight I want to have in an election year because, damn it, I want to win that House. I want to win the White House. I want to win the Senate. And I want to restore this country back to greatness again. Mr. Speaker, you want to respond to uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene? Yeah, of course. Marjorie's a friend. She's frustrated, and so am I. Uh, we have the smallest majority in U.S. history, one vote margin. And we have to grow the House majority. And to her point, we've got to win the Senate and we've got to get President Trump back in the White House. The way we do that is very simple. We have to show the American people what we're for, not just what we're against, but what we're for. You heard at the in your uh, opening, you played the clip of my speech the first night about the seven core principles of American conservatism. Those are the things that we're advancing every single day. So we've got to show the American people what we're for. We have to unite as a conference because clearly with the smallest majority ever, we've got to stand together so we have better negotiating uh, position against the Democrat-controlled Senate and, of course, the Democrat-controlled White House. We only have one half of one-third of the federal government within our 
uh, are, are majority, and it's it's the smallest uh, ever. And then third, the final thing is, and this is, is is really important, we have got to advance our conservative agenda and do so incrementally. If we can't throw a Hail Mary pass right now because we don't have a larger majority, we can move that ball up the field, and we are, and we will. Marjorie's a big part of that. Um, she's a fierce advocate for our principles, and she'll be involved in this. But we're changing the speaker out doesn't change the dynamic. It's about the numbers right now. That's the problem. Yeah. Um we, we talked a little bit about um, this exodus of GOP members. A lot of them have left, kind of left you uh, almost in, almost with a tie. You have a one-vote majority. Now, there have been some people, I, I'm not advocating this, I've had two congressmen call me, Congress people. I'll say it that way, call me saying there's someone on the Democrat side that's paying off some of these members to leave, to leave you with less of a majority. Have you heard that? You want to refute it? Is that nonsense? What are your thoughts? No, I, I don't think that's happening. Um, it is a great concern. We have a number of retirements and some people leaving early for various reasons, personal reasons, family reasons. Look, I respect that, but it does give us an extraordinary challenge. Now, the good news is we have some special elections that we filled over the next uh, next month and the following month. Uh, Kevin McCarthy's seat in California will be filled by a Republican. Bill Johnson, who left to be a college president, um, his seat will be filled in Ohio by another Republican. So we'll get some reinforcements. But we're going through a valley right now, Eric. There's no question about it. You framed it up well in your opening monologue. But but look, it's very hopeful. We're going through the valley, but it is much brighter on the other side. I'm absolutely convinced we're going to grow the House majority. We are going to win the Senate, and we're going to win the White House as well. And we're going to turn this thing 180 degrees. November can't get here soon enough. Mr. Speaker, real quickly, I just want to touch on it. The, the White House and this whole dust up over having a day, trans day of visibility happening be the same day as Easter Sunday it could have been moved. I think it could have been moved to April 1st. It's more appropriate to have the trans day of visibility on April Fool's Day for obvious reasons. That's just my opinion. But the White House had a problem with your take on it, saying that you were misinformed. What's your response to Joe Biden? Yeah, right. The White House claimed that they did not proclaim uh, transgender uh, Visibility Day, but he literally did. He issued a literal physical proclamation, and we posted it on social media to show everyone he actually did that. Now, whether or not the president knew what he signed, uh, that may be the question, but clearly he focused on that on Easter Sunday. And it's just, it's just an outrage to millions and millions of Americans, and I think they're all taking note. I think Joe Biden is underwater for a lot of reasons, Eric, and uh, I think he's going to lose this election, and we can't get there soon enough. Now, Mr. Speaker, I have a question for you. Probably not. You may not have seen this coming. I'm sure my producers haven't seen it coming, but I want to ask it anyway. Uh, Kevin McCarthy gave the some of their most of the uh, January 6 tapes to Tucker Carlson over at Fox. Apparently, the House still has a lot of Jan 6 video. Um, will we see it? Will those things see the light of day? And, and, and if so, when? Yeah, we, we're releasing them uh, in large batches. I think 13,000 of the 40,000 hours have been released so far. And the only reason they're not all out there, I wish I could wave a wand and do it all a day, is that it takes a while to upload and process them. If you do the math, it's five years worth of videotape. So um, I made a commitment uh, immediately after I got the gavel that we would start releasing that. Originally, we were trying to blur some of the faces to protect the innocent, you know, people who were just there and just happened to be walking through the building. Uh, but but then we realized a lot of this is out there in the in the public anyway. And so, yeah, we're releasing America as fast as we possibly can. We had to hire new staff to do it. They're uploading it. It's a 24 hour operation. And uh, all that all that tape will be out there uh, as soon as possible. But 13,000 hours are available yeah, to, now. Yes, yeah. you, you could send me a couple thousand hours. I'll work through it with you. If you, <laughs> if you sure, need, sure, to, need, a, need a little extra help. The good news is, Mr. Speaker, you're going to release that stuff all 44,000, I guess. I, I think that's the news that we. We heard here tonight, Mr. Speaker, you got a tall order. You got a tough job, an unenviable job with what they've made the House Speaker. There were one dissenting vote. You've got to keep 215 or 220 people happy. That's a tall order, and you're doing a good job. Mr. Speaker, Mike Johnson, thank you for joining us. Thanks, my friend. Good talk to you.